You're listening to the Big Three of B2B Leadership Podcast with Mike Faherty, where world-class business leaders share their secrets for personal, organizational, and market growth. Gain powerful insights from industry leaders that have been tested by the fire. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me on the Big Three of B2B Leadership. My name is Mike Faherty, and I am joined today by Manveer Sandhu. And Manveer is the CEO and co-founder of Zenify. Uh, Zenify is a platinum level Salesforce consulting partner. Um, you guys started in 2013, I believe, and they're based in Sacramento. Uh, Manveer is a tremendous business mind, and uh, his success building Zenify over the past seven years has just actually been nothing short of remarkable. It's a pretty awesome story, so I'm looking forward to jumping into some of the details and kind of what that journey has looked like um, today. So welcome, Manveer. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Mike. Great connecting. Yeah, it's awesome. So, um, so I'm always excited to jump into this entrepreneurial journey, especially yours has been pretty remarkable. Um, what you've done with Zenify has really um, has been exceptional. And but before we get into that, I want to sure. go back a little bit further because it's it's interesting to me. I was doing a little research as I tend to do, and so you and I, as we kind of chatted a little bit before we started recording, we you and I probably crossed paths maybe 15 years ago at HP working on an outsourced call center project, um, but we haven't had much chance to catch up since then. And so when I was digging around, um, I, I uncovered a couple of little interesting nuggets I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit. So you, you moved from England to the U.S. when you were six, is that right? Correct. And so, and then I read here that, that you fell in love with football. Now, when I've met you before in person, I'm not surprised that, uh, that you love football, but, um, so tell me a little bit about your experience uh, with football and why football was so uh, – it captured your attention as a six-year-old kid moving from England. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously you – you know, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you, uh, you had a nice career playing at uh, Cal Poly and uh, was a collegiate athlete, and I think that's all fascinating. So tell me a little bit about what, what, what about football really captured your imagination. You know, as you know, in England, you know, they, they have their version of, of football and soccer. The beautiful game is uh, is amazing. All my kids play soccer. So um, but I we, we you know I had no exposure to football. And one day I went to a park, you know, I think I was seven years old and I saw these kids running around with helmets and pads, like, you know, colliding into each other and having a lot of fun and making a lot of noise. I remember I was just in awe, like, what the heck is that? You know, and I like grabbed my dad. I go, I want to do that. And he brought, it's funny. He brought me over to the coach and coach was like, well, you know, we're already halfway through our season tryout next year. So, so, you know, that whole off season, I just totally watched football on TV and like learned the game and just fell in love. My brother and I used to throw the football around all the time. So I started playing really young tackle football. I was like eight you know, just fell in love with it. It was like my childhood passion, pretty much, you know, I just happened to get good grades that like you need, you know, to, to make it in life and ended up being good enough to, uh, you know, to end up playing in college, you know, and, and getting some scholarship money and um, always a little undersized, um, but just made up for it with grit, you know, and, and passion. And it was just, it was just so fun. You know, it was like, it, it's the, I look at it as like the, you know, the glory days of, of your lifetime. And you make so many friendships that, that you, you know, that you still have. And it, it's something that just stays with you forever. So um, I'm a big fan of, of, you know, student athletes. You know, I think it just brings a lot of value. But uh, yeah, it's a great game. I still love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I, I've had a lot of success over my career um, hiring and, and um, bringing on student athletes there. Uh, there's you know, they don't, they haven't cornered the market on being coachable, but uh, almost to a, to a person, they, they just have the mindset of coach me. And yeah. um, sometimes, especially in some of the softer skills like sales and some of the other uh, disciplines around business, someone who's just willing to be coached and is sort of expects it and, and really drives, uh, is driven by it, it. It can be really, really powerful. So that's, I'm not surprised that, that uh, you've taken some of those disciplines and turned it into some pretty amazing success. So in 2013, though, you, uh, you and a couple, couple founders, a couple guys that you knew from HP, I believe, right? Started yep. a firm um, as a global health solutions company. Correct. 
and now. I don't think many people would make a connection between global health solutions and Salesforce. So when I was reading this, I, I was still even having a hard time, like, how did these two things really come together? And when I, when I read a little bit about some of your first projects and some of the work that you did in Haiti, it was yeah. fascinating how these two platforms came together. So can you talk a little bit about what, what got started? Absolutely. And HP is a little bit of a bridge, you know, so bringing, bringing you back to the HP days, I mean, you and I worked on some technology initiatives, like, for example, around the integrated desktop and eventually so, uh, HP would choose Salesforce as their CRM platform, you know, across the company. And so I was, I got involved with that and really like Siebel, as we all know, was, was not a very good solution for us at the, right. you know, back in the day. And so Salesforce, you know, from a CRM perspective was just so robust. I fell in love with it. You know, I was like, well, this is a really awesome solution. Eventually I took a role on at HP where I, I was running a chunk of business, you know, similar to yourself. And I was like, Salesforce needs to be a big part of this thing. And I need to hire some people that could like help me sort of configure the system. And as you know, HP goes through all these ups and downs and ups and downs. And at the time they were like, you can hire from Boise or Houston. I don't know if you remember some of that stuff because everything had consolidated to these sites. And so right. I was like, okay, you know, I'll take anybody I can get. And so there's a call center, HP shopping call center in Boise. And I did some interviewing and recruiting and I landed, you know, two people that ended up being my co-founders at Zenify, um, Nathan Mueller and Jesse Barker. And I was like, Hey, let's just figure out Salesforce. Let's get it going. We need, uh, we need to build out some portals and some crazy things. And they were able to figure it out. Uh, we were very successful with that, and it, it sort of connected us to the Salesforce ecosystem. I, um, I ended up doing a keynote at their big Dreamforce conference uh, in 2012, and wow. around, right, yeah, around the same time, uh, my my boss at HP through HP Philanthropy connected us to UNICEF, and so we got to work on some cool projects in conjunction with HP in, in Africa. Um, one was around infant HIV. And so we just, you know, that just really turned us on to a whole world of like, how do you, how can we leverage innovation and technology to solve, you know, these crazy health problems that are across the world, especially in the developing world. Um, built a great relationship with UNICEF. My co-founder, Nathan Mueller, um, really just has a strategic mind and passion for solving these kinds of challenges. And so after the earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010, big challenge in Haiti was around uh, infrastructure damage that was causing compromises to the vaccine supply chain. So they were concerned that the vaccines that they were refrigerating in all these clinics was, um, was spoiling because of power outages. So we, we, um, we spent several weeks there, uh, the three of us, and audited the supply chain, did a bunch of analysis, and essentially concluded that you know up to 50% of their vaccines were compromised. So they're either administering bad medicine or they're throwing it all away. Right. And they just didn't have the data. It was a data challenge. Right. And so Mark Benioff, you know, if you research him, CEO of Salesforce is also very right. philanthropic. And so he had donated free licenses um, to the country. And so we knew about that going in and that's a huge deal. And they didn't know what to do with these licenses. And we did because, you know, that was our world. And they also had a solid 3G, 4G network in Haiti you know, versus like traditional landline networks. So we were like, wow, we have these very two powerful parts of the infrastructure are in play. We could solve this problem. You know, how do we connect these refrigerators to the cloud? And we, we dubbed the project Fridges at Talk. Uh, we had an IoT device uh, manufactured. And so we did this small pilot where we tested things out. Basically a Ministry of Health worker, if a refrigerator went out of temperature compliance, they get an alert, a text that tells them, hey, this refrigerator's out of temperature compliance. Here's when it went out of compliance. You know, you need to go triage it. So now they could actually salvage this medicine, do whatever they needed to do uh, to keep it viable. So it ended up becoming like, you know, it had published in a medical journal and ended up being the standard like globally for how you do something like this in a, in a developing world like Haiti. Uh, and it put us on the map. You know, we ended up you know, starting our company around that time frame as, a, as a, initially a nonprofit in this global health space, but without funding, it's tough to survive in that space because we, you know, totally bootstrapped. So we just ended up pivoting, doing different things to earn money over time, um, so that we could just scale the practice up. But that was really our our start, you know. So, so that kind of takes us to 
sort of today, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but so tell me a little bit about Zenify, just broadly, kind of what your focus is now, what kind of services you offer, what, what, who your business serves. Absolutely. Um, so at the heart of it, we're a technology consulting firm that advises on, you know, what are the sort of right technologies for organizations that are, you know, going through a massive digital transformation, right? Even during this pandemic, you, you see how many organizations had to shut down their physical doors and move to a digital world. And a lot of them were exposed, you know, they don't necessarily have the infrastructure. So that's where we come into play, partnering with organizations like Salesforce to really recommend, you know, like here's sort of the technology that you need. Um, and we just go the next level by actually implementing it. Right. Cause we've got the very experienced technical and people and the consultants to, you know, drive a, uh, what would be a very complicated transformation um, and get it done inside of like 12 to 18 months. And, and that's really rewarding. So if you look about, if you think back to our founding principles was all around technology and innovation to solve problems that hasn't changed, right? We're, we're applying those same principles, except we're applying them now to maybe different types of organizations like banks, for example, um, or mortgage organizations or wealth advisories. And um, we're actually getting back into the health and life science game as well. So it really is like, you know, I think I talked to you about this uh, in an email, all the technology that we really needed back in the day when you and I were working together, Mike, like around the integrated desktop and, you know, really the technology wasn't available, honestly. Like we were drafting stuff up that was conceptual, but it wasn't possible back then, not without spending like, you know, $50 million, right? Now it's available. The technology is really advanced, you know, and it's, it's, you know, next level stuff that like, I'm not saying it's easy, but you can even take a smaller organization, like a small bank, and they can do some pretty transformative things with the technology that's available and get it done inside of a year, right? You know, that's, that's just huge. You know, like statistics say that like 90% of these big digital transformations fail and take, you know, two, three, four years. You remember how long this stuff took at HP, right? Sure. All of a sudden the game has changed, you know, and, and we've literally helped organizations from the beginning of the pandemic to now transform their technology stack so they can go to market in this, in the digital space, which is the way their consumers want to interact with them. Uh, so it's, it's just awesome. It's really rewarding. You know, uh, the technology behind you plays a big role. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, the, the development of the cloud has been massively important. I think, you know, we're, I think we're just getting started. I think really the cloud, I'm not, I mean, this isn't my idea, but I think really cloud is, is sort of the next internet. It's, yeah, it's just, I, I totally next, agree. It's just the next transformative technology that will enable everything. We were talking a little bit before, you know, I, three years ago, I virtualized my, my business and, you know, we don't have a server. Mm -hmm. uh, we run our entire company off cloud applications and cloud services, and we share documents and communicate and run applications. And we haven't had a server in years. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's, there's still organizations that are, are still, you know, hardware, you know, um, infrastructure based uh, and they're, they all need to move that direction. They all will eventually to some degree. Eventually. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, that's fascinating. You're in a great space and, uh, and I'm sure being in the right place at the right time doesn't hurt, um, in having the right ideas and, and, and having the know how, um, so over the last seven years, you guys have had this sort of meteoric, you know, sort of growth and, you know, how many employees are, do you guys have now? Uh, we're up to 120. Wow. Um, in fact, we just hired during, you know, we, we typically December is not a big hiring month um, or November because you've got vacation and Christmas and Thanksgiving. Right. And we just hired like 15 people, you know, just in the last several weeks during wow. like what, what's ordinarily not a good, you know, great time. So there's a lot of demand for, yeah. you know, for talent and, and this technology right now. And um, it, like a lot of it's timing. Like you said, it's timing, timing it right, but it's a combination of having the right talent. You know, this organization, we're a people business. It's all about our leadership and our talent that we have at various levels of the organization, be it technical, um, be it, you know, operations, just having those right pieces come together at the right time um, is, is incredible. So, you know, is that been sort of a, a a steady sort of consistent growth or has there been a, was there an inflection point or was there a transformative moment in, you know, an idea, a breakthrough, a, 
you know, yeah. good fortune that sort of accelerated things for you? There, there was. I think in 2016, um, we, you know, if you go back to what I described in Haiti, what we did as a pilot, and the reason we did it as a pilot is that we could not get funding. We had to use our own money to solve that problem. And the key to that is proving it. Why do you do a, a proof of concept? It's because your, your client or your stakeholder isn't convinced and they need proof that you could pull it off and get it done. So that principle has stuck with us from the very beginning is like, how do you earn trust? Well, you earn trust by proving it, right? And proving it consistently. So in 2016, um, there was a, a very large uh, 401k advisory practice that was evaluating Microsoft Dynamics versus Salesforce. And, you know, a lot of these guys are historically Microsoft shops. And so you had to kind of really win them over. And so that's what we did. You know, we took the risk, we took the chance and we said, look, well, let us get access to some of your environment and help you see how it could work. And we, uh, we proved the concept. You know, we did this demo and they saw how it could all come together and work. They chose Salesforce over Microsoft. And that was a big transformative moment because that was a very strategic win for Salesforce at a time when they had just moved to this industry vertical strategy. You know, they used to be more generalist and then they had moved to this sort of, uh, you know, we're going to have financial services, we're going to have healthcare, we're going to have public sector. And so this was a big win in that financial services category. And they were kind of like, hey, let's partner, let's team up together. We love the work that you guys did in Haiti. They always knew us as the Haiti guys. Oh, you guys are right. that frigid talk, you know, but we, we had to prove our reputation beyond that. And that was, you know, one of those shining moments and opportunities for us to kind of seize the day. And since then, it's just, we really took off because we found our vertical niche, you know, and generally when you, when you play things at a vertical level, you start to solve problems. You start to see common challenges within an industry and you start to build expertise. And so that was that transformative moment for us where we went from in just in 2016 to 2017, we went from about uh, 17 people to like 65 people, right? And so that was a big jump. And, and we've been growing like that ever since. The pandemic um, was a little rocky for us. And I know we're probably gonna talk about that more um, but we've even been able to sort of break through, you know, there was a lull, there was some pullback, but we were able to sort of break through that. And, and now we're starting to see the growth again. Um, so I don't, I don't think the pandemic is, is uh, going to have that, that huge effect that we initially thought it might have. So you, you were talking about verticals. So, you know, when other business owners or founders are, are, are trying to figure out what the strategy is, it's going to take them to the next level. Yeah. You know, what's your, what's your thought on niching the market down, um, sort of making the world a little bit smaller so you can be more focused? Do you think that that makes sense? It obviously worked to some degree for you. Uh, was, is that a strategy that you would recommend or, or do you feel like you're better off keeping your, your options more open and, and being more generalized in, in the markets that you serve? What do you think mm -hmm. about that? Um, it's a great question. I, I think having more focus is, is better. And the reason I say that is it, it helps you differentiate, you know, especially in a world that's where there's a lot of competition. Um, there's some commoditization that happens, you know, what's your differentiating edge? What do you bring to the table that's unique versus the other guys? And when you focus more, let's say on an industry vertical, um, again, you start to build, um, expertise some of that expertise is in your talent and some of the methodologies and practices they bring to the table some of that expertise is in the form of ip right you start to build some unique technological components that give you an edge um, so I, I i actually like the industry vertical approach now how you arrive at that is interesting because we had a journey you know we started in health and life sciences and then we ended up going general uh, to go to, to arrive at financial services, right? So the journey is, is important, but I think as you're going through that journey, um, it's really important to assess the market, size the market, um, you know, get feedback, by the way, from the ecosystem, you know, um, ask, talk to other companies like yourself, maybe that are bigger. It's interesting. People are more willing to share information than you think. You know, you would think like, wow, I compete against them. Are they really going to talk to me? And um, interestingly enough, 
it, usually they will, right? Very few times is somebody like, oh, I'm not going to talk to you guys. You know, I don't want you to, to grow or survive or be a competitor. So you get inputs from the industry. You get input, inputs from uh, some of the real known technology players in the industry, you know, like a Salesforce, like an Amazon, like a Microsoft. All these tidbits of information help you formulate kind of a hypothesis, right? That says, I think if we, you know, bank on this, and invest our time here and our money here, that'll help us get to the next level. We're actually at, at that inflection point again, where we're gonna be ready to make another bet or two um, on the future. So it isn't like, wow, we've made it, you know what I mean? Because there's still more frontier to tackle. So we have to actually do some of the same things and analysis we did before now. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. So, you know, obviously partner, you mentioned a couple, you mentioned Salesforce, Amazon, you know, uh, others. So how important has strategic partnerships been as a growth strategy for you? Huge for us because, you know, and, and this is near and dear to you, Mike, because you, I know you're with, with some of what you're doing, there's some business development, you know, there's some door opening type activities and that is hard, right? It's, it's challenging to, you know, get those doors open and get those leads when you're an unknown entity when you're not a brand name right and right. we're often competing usually we're competing against companies much larger than us like we are still even though we've grown and we're 120 people we're still a fraction of the size of some of our major competitors so how do you um, get leads in an industry when you have these giants out there and so we decided that we would focus more on our technology and our technology leadership in, in conjunction with an alliance with those partners to help to uh, drive essentially those leads, more or less. And that alliance approach, channel approach, um, has been very healthy for us. It's, it's worked out quite well. Um, but what's helped in, the, in that regard is that technology leadership. It's those innovative stories dating back to Haiti, the things that we've done to you know, stand out and differentiate ourselves you know, and to make that impression that like, wow, these guys have something special they've got this differentiating edge um you know and then once that door is open with that prospect being able to bring that to the table um is huge you know because you're up against big companies that you know maybe they've got a 46 page slide deck and you know 46 referral you know uh, reference customer references but then there's an authenticity that comes out when a Zenify shows up you know and when you've gotten to the point where you're a, you've scaled and you have the infrastructure and you've proven it, now you can be really effective because what organizations are looking for is like, yeah, I want your advice. I want your knowledge. I want your expertise. But in the end, I want a partner, you know, somebody that's going to be with me on the long-term journey. And a lot of those, um, you know, principles come into play. You know, what are your values? How much is this company, you know, going to be here in the long term with me? Uh, and that applies to your partners and your clients. So a lot of those things have, have been huge for us over time. Well, you just brought up kind of where I wanted to go next. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about culture. So you mentioned at the very beginning, you're a people company. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, how you've used culture as a competitive advantage uh, in your business. Absolutely. So it, it's one of the things that's interesting is uh, there, there's two facets to this, right? There's the startup side of things. You know, when you're in the very beginning, you, you're constrained in many, many ways. You know, money is one of the big ways you're constrained. And it's hard to go out and find super talented people that have already built the expertise and experience. You can find them, but can, will they take the risk to come to your company because you're such an unknown? Um, can you afford them? All those things make it very difficult in the beginning. So you have to sort of think about like, well, how, how do we get there in a very creative way um, where, you know, I, I don't break the bank just to hire one person when I could, you know, I could grow and develop four or five people. So an interesting statistic about us is like, you know, we're a consulting organization at the end of the day, but 80% of our team is this, is, this was their first consulting gig, right? So we have all these walks of life at Zenify. We have ex-military. We have people that worked in the fast food industry, um, you know, folks without college degrees. Um, we have folks that come out of code camps, you know, these technology accelerators. And so 
we, we took a risk on some of those models because we saw something special in all these individuals, common traits and characteristics. You know, are they self-driven? Are they go-getters? What are their values like? You know, are their values aligned with our values? And when you take this type of approach over time, you start to build this thing called culture, right? And you've got common people that believe in common things that, you know, they believe in um, the company representing something bigger than just being a technology consulting company. You know, it's how we behave, how we treat each other. Um, what's our impact in the world? What's our impact in our local communities? What's our impact to, uh, you know, creating jobs and giving back? And so some of those things have been with us from the very beginning because we started the company in a, in a unique way. And that's attracted those kind of people, right? Now, what's interesting is as we've gotten bigger, there's a real need for some of these really experienced ninja type people that ordinarily would have been hard to find. Um, so the second facet of this is in our industry, there's a lot of exits that, that happen, right? There's a lot of buyouts. Eventually companies get to a certain size and then a larger company buys them. Well, what ends up happening, unfortunately, often with those companies is that culture changes like literally overnight. And so all these individuals that were with that company from the very beginning and love that culture now are seeking that out saying, man, I don't, you know, I don't feel like the same vibe anymore. And so now we're able to attract those people to our firm, you know, to that central DNA that has been with us from the beginning of time. So that's that magical thing that happens once you get bigger is you start to get referrals because people that work for you that are enjoying that like experience, it's so refreshing. They go, oh man, I want to go tell other people that are like awesome out there about this. And then you start to get that like multiplier effect. So that's how it's been really effective for us. Are you using any particular platform, software, you know, service to help you understand who your candidates are as people? Or do you do, you do anything like that right now? Today, you put them through uh, some testing or some evaluation in any way? Nothing too advanced, you know, because there's yeah. some advanced stuff that's popping up. There's some AI, there's some AI type solutions. It's actually a really exciting space, by the way. Um, but we're mostly using LinkedIn. Um, and then we're using Salesforce pretty much as our applicant management side of things. One thing we do is we eat our own dog food. So Salesforce plays a big role. I mean, it is our ERP in many, many, many ways. Um, we use it for recruiting. We use it for forecasting and all these great things. Um, it's very effective. But we also um, are exploring some profiling tools right now um, that might like, like let's profile ourselves right you now and figure ourselves out and let's see if, you know, profiling uh, some of the external prospects and how that matches up. So we haven't done that yet, but something that we're thinking okay. about that could be interesting. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think, I think people are starting to come to terms with that, that those, those I'll call them technologies, but methodologies or assessments, um, can provide an insight that it's difficult to get through just an interview process. And so I think we'll see more and more people implementing those things uh, successfully okay. over time. I, I know we we're kind of exploring some of those ideas too. So it sounds like maybe we're on the same, same path there. Um, so w tell me about, uh, tell me what it's like to try to grow a business quickly with two partners. Tell me about, you know, not, you know, there's there's three people I have to come to some form of agreement, you know, on on big decisions, um, or or maybe not. I, talk to me a little bit about how you guys navigate tough business decisions as as a sort of three headed leadership team. It's a great it's a great question. Um, I think there's there's two parts to it. One part is that we each have our strengths, you know, and and weaknesses to some extent, and we've been working together for so long together, you know, like over ten years that. We, we can recognize that in each other. You know, I have a finance background. I've always been strong with, you know, financial analysis and strategy and some of those things. And Nathan's got the gift of gab. He's just brilliant at um, just sales and coming in and identifying um, what the strategic pain points are and how do we want to position ourselves. Um, and Jesse's strong operationally. And so we've always kind of known, like, what's our, what's our individual strengths and, so, so it's always been a natural process. There's always so much work to do, if you think about it. Like, right. we shouldn't be in our, each other's, you know, uh, 
turfs to some extent. There's so much to do in the end, you know. Um, so, so some of it's just been a very logical divide and conquer. Um, the other part of it that I, is significant, though, is, you know, again, it's that, that cultural grounding, right, that all of a sudden we have something that we've developed over time that is always with us as almost a governing force too, right? Because you, you, you make a decision that starts to eat into that cultural component, you're really killing yourself, right? So there's some like self um, or driven organic, um, let's just say checks and balances that have come into play. Another important one is our, our leadership team as a whole. So if you, you know, it's not just the three of us. I've got a, uh, you know, a chief strategy officer. I've got a chief operations officer. We have uh, our vice president of sales. You know, we've got, you know, really strong leaders in an organization. I joke with people, but it's, it's mostly true. It's like, you know, I've got five or six bosses. Um, you know, I may be the CEO, but I've got like five or six really strong leaders that have, um, a lot that they bring to the table. Um, and so we do a lot by consensus, believe it or not. Like when we're going to decide what the next great market is for us to go after, uh, it's not going to be one person that decides, right? It's going to be a, a group think, um, you know, almost consensus based uh, decision making process. And I think it's making us better, by the way, you know, because. You, you just have so much talent in the room and differing opinions and different views that, um, you know, we've really been able to get on the same page. And we've spent a lot of time as a leadership team together. You know, at one time we weren't so strong, right? Like we had complex and we invested in that relationship of our team and it's been huge. You know, we're in a different place today. So I, I know you've got two main sites in Sarah, um, sorry, um, Sacramento and Boise is, was that from the very beginning or were you guys all in one place to start? No, so that it was like that from the beginning. I was here um, and, you know, Nathan and Jesse were in Boise and they're, again, they're kind of great up and coming mid-market cities where there's some opportunity, you know, right in your backyard. If you, um, you know, you're creative and you know how to go after it. You know, I actually, we were in public sector state of California, you know, huge IT budget. Um, you know, in Boise, they won some really unique business there between some SMBs and also uh, Simplot, which is one of the world's largest agriculture companies. So a lot of that is just doing networking in your local region, which is awesome, by the way, you know, just the fact that you can, you know, start to connect with local economic leaders and just local leaders in general. And so uh, it's just worked out that way. And, and they ended up being great markets. So we ended up opening offices in both the cities and talent the talent pool in the cities is fantastic as well. Um, so it's another advantage that, that made it logical for us just to focus on where we were, which is home. So what do you think, if you were talking to a founder who's, you know, who's just getting started, you know, they've got their core team together, maybe they got a minimal viable product and they're trying to, they, they think they're onto something, right? Um, what, what's some advice that you would give them about, you know, kind of navigating this this process and and um moving from you know small to to large you know what, yeah. what thoughts were what what advice would you give what are some of the lessons the key lessons that you'd hope to impart on them yeah i think that three things probably stand out right one is the prove it concept you know something that we learned from the very beginning um, and if you watch enough shark tank i feel like oftentimes the sharks are saying that to those um, perspective businesses like, hey, you've got this great idea, but you're not really ready for our money yet. You need to go prove it, right? You need to go test it out in the market. Let me see some revenue. Um, so I think people tend to early, too early in the game say, okay, wow, now I need help. Now I need a big investor. Now I need a big something or another. Um, and if you, if you flip the script, it's like, well, from the investor standpoint, it's like, well, go show me that you can get it, make it happen, right? Show me what you're made of. Show me that your well, show me what your product is or your service is made of. So that's the one thing is um, you can do more than you think, you know, with with the money and the people that you have, you know, with creativity and resilience and grit. That word grit is, you know, I know it's a it's kind of getting played out, but it's like it's the real deal. I'm sure you had to do it, Mike, with your business in the beginning. You know, it's just it's working through those tough times and 
you know, not saying, oh man, I, we're out of money or we don't have money or we don't have this. The second piece is like some of the talent you bring on in that early phase of the game can be really, really, really transformative for you. You know, like our chief operations officer started as a consultant with us, right? And she was a badass consultant and saved our bacon so many times. And she's just so talented, so amazing that over time she became a director and then she became a vice president as a head of all of our professional services. And then she became our chief operations officer. You know, and we have several of these kind of people from the very beginning. Like a lot of our, our senior level leaders are people that have organically grown through the organization and they've been with us from, from the very beginning, which is, um, which is huge, which means those early hires, you know, and, and some of these people are taking a risk with you. They're not getting paid maybe what they would get paid somewhere else, you know. Um, they're, they're, they know that like this business may fail, you know, but like there's, you know, in having those guts though, and, and those guys making those commitments, it, it just adds so much to your, um, your overall leadership at such an early stage. And the final thing I say is the financials, you know, um, if you don't know the financials, learn the financials, right? You know, and, and Mike, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. I remember you were just starting to do some investing um, back in the day, you know, and you were, you were doing some home I remember you were buying some homes and doing some renting and, and you had to learn that stuff, right? You had to figure it out. You had to understand it. You couldn't rely upon your broker or your agent or alone to like tell you what to do, right? You had to understand the economics of the moves you were making. And I'm fortunate that I have a financial background, but at the same time, you know, you can learn this stuff. It's, it's not that hard. You know, people that say, oh, I hate spreadsheets and oh, it's like, well, then you shouldn't run a business at the end of the day, right? You have no business running a business. If financials and, you know, spreadsheets and Excel and Google Sheets, you know, makes you nervous and gets you intimidated. You know what I mean? Like you're, you need to be living in those spreadsheets. Right. Uh, so that, that, that'd be my advice. No, I, that's awesome. I, something that you said just really struck me because it's, I think it's so, it's, you know, it's so important that these guys that, um, you know, that they've got their minimal viable product. Something we talk about all the time. People will come to us, just like you said, oh, I'm ready for, I'm ready for funding. I'm ready for the next big thing. I'm ready to, to make it big. And, you know, the conversation we'll have is, look, you, you're, you're just not ready yet. You, you yeah. need what I, the way I phrase it with them is that you need some hand to hand combat, Like you're going to have to go fight and win a few things before you really that's whenever you really solidify your offer. That's when you really solidify your value proposition, who your target, you think your target customer looks like this and you think the problem that they're solving is that. And whenever you go and try to actually win those deals and you go fight with the competition a few times, you realize actually I was a little bit off here and just a little bit off here. And you need to figure those things out before you start pouring a bunch of money into marketing to the wrong people with the wrong message. Totally. And so, and there's, there's only a, so much market research can get you. Uh, some of that just has to be fought and won. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm sure if we asked you in the beginning of the business, it, when you were starting, it was clear to you, it was crystal clear. It was going to be about, you know, uh, world health organizations, right? It was going to be about this totally. global health you know, challenges. And that's, you were going to solve those problems, right? Yep. And, grown your business tremendously in the financial sector because, because it, you know, although you could service those customers, there was another market need that you could service maybe even better or the market opportunity was even greater for you and you discovered it and then Absolutely. you accelerated growth, right? Absolutely. Making those pivots, you know, and, right. and having the guts to do it, you know, is, 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 a, is a big one. Absolutely. Well, look, um, maybe that's, that's about all the time I had. I told you I'd get you out at the, uh, at the top of the hour. So, uh, I, man, I just can't tell you how much I've enjoyed the conversation. It's so good being able to catch up with you again. Um, and uh, so, look, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? If people like what you're talking about or maybe, you know, they think you might be able to help, what's the best way for them to reach Ascentify? I'm very active on LinkedIn, you know. Okay. It's a great platform for, you know, collaborating, connecting on different topics. And um, I make myself available just, you know, like you and I connected, you know, a little bit advanced notice. So I, I love having conversations. You know, I'm all about, um, you know, just 
community, you know, and, and sharing and, and sharing ideas and helping each other out, I think is a, is a, it's a gift, right? It's a great part of, of getting to this level. Absolutely. So that's, that's tremendous. So um, we'll make sure that your LinkedIn profile and how to find Zenify, your website and your uh, LinkedIn company page is on our show notes uh, that'll be posted on our website, prosalesconnection.com slash podcast. So you can find um, this interview there. Um, not only do you get the audio, but you get the pleasure of taking a, taking a look at me and I, um, right. I tell you, you won't be disappointed. I promise. <laughs> well, look, um, before I wrap it up, I just want to give everyone um, that's been uh, that's been following this podcast. I, I just want to take a moment to to give you my thanks. Uh, I really appreciate everyone listening in, sharing the podcast with their friends and 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 uh, their colleagues uh, whenever they hear something they thought was interesting or, or relevant to their business. I'm just really grateful for that. If you like what you're hearing, you like what we're doing here, uh, please give us a five star review on iTunes. It's it's just. Um, it's really the only way for us to be found uh, more easily by more and more people. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is get our message out about, about all these great companies that we get a chance to spend some time with like Zenify. And so, um, so please do that for me. And, um, and look, remember, um, you know, B2B leaders grow companies faster uh, when they focus on the big three of B2B leadership. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a tremendous day. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Thanks, man, dear. Pro Sales Connection is a sales and marketing firm that has been helping B2B companies grow faster since 2009. Learn more about our proprietary fastest path to revenue process for B2B companies. Experiencing the possibilities begins with a short 15-minute call. Schedule yours at www.prosalesconnection.com and click Get Started.